Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my session today. Um, I am calling in from New York City. I am not currently uh, in, in the conference space, as you might have recognized by my background and virtual Zoom connection. Um, but I appreciate uh, your community here today and joining us for our discussion on open source analytics and analysis. Um, I put this talk together to be oriented for anyone who's um, either building or growing or maturing a metrics program around open source. I've seen a couple of other metrics related presentations uh, during this event. So I'm excited to add to the pile and hopefully provide a perspective that's really rooted in the data and an analyst perspective. Um, because I am an analyst, I call myself a research analyst. I am technically a program manager within our open source programs office at Google, but in that the programs I manage are our research and analysis programs. Um, if you are not here or watching this in real time and can't interact with the Zoom link, um, you can find me on Twitter uh, afterward if you have any questions or follow up. Um, I have a little bit more about me in terms of an introduction and it will kind of explain why I'm focusing on what I'm focusing on for this talk. Um, I, my background is in market research. I started my career at Forrester, writing, building, designing surveys, working with survey data and eventually moving into an analyst role where I served as a market research and consultant to technology buyers, builders and sellers in the data center infrastructure and cloud uh, markets. Um, and then moved to Google as an industry analyst and then eventually into the open source programs office again as a program manager. Um, in addition to my work at companies, I also work with the chaos community discussing metrics and language around designing metrics around project health and risk. So the consistent layer through all of these things and throughout my entire career has always been working with various types and kinds of data. Um, and if anyone else has worked with data in, in their own personal or professional life, you'll probably experience some areas where nothing is as clean as you want it to be. In fact, I've spent so many hours just cleaning data sets to put them in a place that make them usable for analysis and reporting. Um, and so I wanted to kind of preface the conversation with acknowledging how messy these, these data sets can be um, and that the messiness is generally characteristic of the kind of data in and itself. So say if you're working with business data, um, you could be dealing with some limitations based on the systems that were put in place um, that organize, that design the processes and policies around how these tools collect, store, retain information and how various people in the organization are authorized to distribute that. Um, if you're dealing with survey data, you're always going to be dealing with some kind of bias, um, whether or not it's the person who wrote the question, how they framed the question, how they filtered the panel to be able to answer that question. So some are more biased by design, but even say if you're looking for a general consumer panel, um, there's a lot of ways to try to redistribute, reweight, and rebalance the population to try to make it representative. But even if you do all of that work, you still can't um, inhibit the bias that's going to come in from the respondent taking the survey. And if they're having a really bad day, that's going to color how they respond to your questions. Um, and then public data has a lot of the same challenges as business data, um, but potentially more nuanced based on the reporting policies and inconsistency. So say I, I started one of my jobs as a financial analyst looking at 10Ks and trying to trend areas in the market by what companies were reporting year over year um, and quickly found that outside of the core balance sheet, you could report on any metrics that you wanted to in terms of how you grouped various areas of the business um, and various revenues attached to those segments. And so if you're trying to trend that year over year uh, and you were like me, you found out that folks or companies didn't have to necessarily keep those consistent. So from a reporting perspective, that was fine. From an, a metrics analysis perspective, a bit challenging. Now, when, we, when I started working with open source, um, I started dealing with even, even more challenges and ambiguity. And, and it all started with just even how you define a project. Um, is it a code base? Is it a series of repositories? Is it actually a data set? Is it a framework, a series of designs? If you work with open source hardware projects, um, you're often dealing with um, you're often dealing with a series of designs and processes to assemble them to create a piece of hardware. Um, and then again, the chaos community, we talk about metrics and language and trying to standardize various ways to talk about kinds and styles of contribution. Um, there are some that will say that open source is really defined by the license that governs it. And I agree with this, but some of the beauty in the licenses themselves is they don't actually define what you're talking about. They define how you can use it and what you can do with it, but it actually can be applied to any of the above. Um, and I'd be curious to see if others have come across even other types of projects that are defined by open source licenses. 
Um, in addition to the variability in the project itself and the parameters around the project, there's also variety in how you can work on a project and the types and styles of contribution uh, that you can make to an individual project. And if it's primarily a piece of software, then maybe you're looking primarily at writing, reviewing code, bug and triage and issues. Um, but you could also be working in community management. You could be working in documentation, translation, localization. Maybe you're supporting the user and contributor populations on public forums they try to work through some of these issues, or maybe you're supporting more back office things like financial management and accounting. Um, I'm bringing this up now because this is a, a hot topic, an area of conversation in both the academic and in the open source communities and ecosystems. Um, I'm here referencing a piece of research that came out of the University of Vermont that was trying to attempt to categorize the various kinds of contribution that are portrayed in data systems that are regularly available and ones that are not. Um, within the chaos community too, we've been talking about how to quantify and measure various types of contribution. So I think I, I saw somewhere a tweet that my colleague from chaos, Georg Link, had presented a similar slide looking at the various ways that you can count and measure different kinds and styles of contribution. Um, I'm bringing that up here in the context of data and metrics collection because these things will determine what types of data that you're working with. So if you're primarily working with code and understanding development activities around code, you're working with data coming off of Git streams, issue streams. Um, if you're looking more at support activities and interaction with the users, then maybe you're looking more at forums and discussion groups in forums. Um, if you're looking more at community management and what feedback on how things are running, how events are running, how the content is, then maybe you want to write a survey to better understand your community and any of the feedback they might have about these various things. Um, and then maybe if you're working more with promotional content and you want to better understand where people are coming from, how they're finding your things, how they're finding your website, how they're finding information and whether or not they're progressing past that point, then maybe you're running something like site analytics. So all of these different things require different tools, require different kinds of data to work with that can be used to aggregate information about your community and your project. So I'm going to focus a bit more on source code logs because I know that's that's kind of the, the primary focus area for a lot of these programs. It is, again, some of the most readily available information. Um, and again, if your project is primarily a piece of software, then this kind of information is very indicative around the productivity happening in the code base itself. Um, but working with this kind of data has its own challenges that have yet to be enumerated in all the various data and messiness challenges that I had enumerated before. Um, particularly that if you work with Git data, um, and hopefully this isn't new for everyone, but it was new for me when I started working with it, is learning that historical data can change. Um, if you were talking about this in the context of business data, and I said that historical data changed, then the first assumption is that somebody made a mistake uh, and you had to go and correct it, and that's why the numbers change. But in the context of Git, when you merge a fork into the main branch, the history of that fork becomes the history of the project. So if that fork replaced something that existed before, then it's also going to replace the data that described what exists before. So depending on where and when and how you pull the data and when and, and you pull, might pull it again in the same time period and write the same, same query over the same time period, the numbers might change. Um, and so there are various efforts looking at what are the best ways to provide a long-standing and archive view of a project development and productivity over time that accounts for all these various permutations of the same data set. But when you're just dealing with things being pulled off the API, mostly assume that you're looking at the current state, not the actual historical state. Um, in addition to that, when you're working with, say, GitHub APIs, there are some rate limits that will limit what information you can pull and how much you can pull um, that could loss and loss that could result in loss or missing data if you're working with very large projects or very active projects with a lot of activity logs coming through. Um, and then note if you're working with multiple data sources or even multiple APIs in the same data source that the schema don't always match. Say even with then various different streams in GitHub, you could be working with the issue stream, the event stream, the webhook stream. They have different things that they're tracking that are triggered by different kinds of events that include different things in their payload and in terms of the actions that they track. So if you are collecting from multiple sources, then it's mostly a note to understand how you're aggregating and connecting these pieces of information because they're not always going to be like for like. Um, and a note on consistency and just an example. Um, of where missing data can impact what you see. Um, here we're looking at a query across the GitHub archive, which is a comprehensive collection of the GitHub event stream. Um, we have been collecting it at Google and BigQuery. It's a public data set if you're interested in poking around in there. Um, this is just a query that I ran um, that looked at the total activity count 
um, across various um, various tables, but all represented the same time period of 2020. And you can see that the numbers here do not agree. They're in the same order of magnitude, but the variation tells me that something is missing somewhere or something is being counted more than another thing. Um, and I don't necessarily have an answer of what is happening here. I can just show you that we know something is up. Um, this is the area of conversation that we've had within the GitHub Archive project, and I encourage if folks are really interested in pursuing this problem, it is a, a public project on GitHub. Um, another factor that comes into play when you're working with especially data coming out of Git uh, and source code logs is that there are a lot of machines and bots that are doing things and they could be explicitly called bots and they could be automated scripts coming from personal accounts. And either way, they're just all mixed up in there with all of the human based activity and reports that you could be generating. And not to say the machine data isn't present in other systems, it's just typically a little bit more either distinct or being collected in different media. Say you're talking about infrastructure monitoring tools that are looking all at machine productivity and efficiency. Um, and you're tabulating that over time to see how you're doing and how what you write could be impacting it. But at the same time, you're tracking that separately from the human-based activities. Whereas in Git, um, you can have a script that's coming from a personal account that's designed to do things, but a person has not actually initiated every time because it's written as a script. And as I mentioned, this can lead to some noise and confusing numbers. Um, personal anecdote, I was looking at Google's overarching contribution stats for the year 2020. And I found that in July, there was one personal handle that was responsible for over 40% of push events across the company. Now for a sense of scale, there are thousands of Googlers working on tens of thousands of repositories, submitting hundreds of thousands of push events every year. And so this 40% number in one single month was fairly substantial. So we reached out to that individual and found out that it was the result of a broken mirror that just kept trying to copy things in between um, repositories and it kept failing. So it kept trying to copy until it was identified and shut down by the human. Um, meaning that in the data set, I had an incredible amount of noise that did not actually represent human-based activity, even though it was marked under demarcated under a human-based account. Um, so I went through and filtered it and removed it. Um, so here is the suggestion here is always sort your data and look for outliers um, because they might not be doing what you think they're doing. And if you do want to report on say human-centric activities, then it's wise to keep some sort of reference of a list either to have the people you know you want to track and filter them in or have the bots that you know you don't want to count and filter them out. Um, an example here is from the DevStats project, which runs all of the dashboards and analytics for the CNCF projects. Um, they maintain a known list of bots um, that anyone can contribute to as they appear in various projects. Um, for a sense of scale, I ran a very basic query, I'm saying basic because it's not perfect, um, where I was identifying bots by BOT and the actor login handle. So basically, if you wrote bot in your handle um, and identified this particular account as a bot, that's how I'm counting it. But if you are a human and you have BOT in your handle, then I'm also counting you. So this is not perfect. And that's why I use the phrase, we estimate that there are over 120 million bots that were submitting activity uh, on 20, in 2020 on GitHub. Um, and just for a sense of who these are, um, the top one was a depend upon, which we know definitively that this is a bot. So personal anecdote again, thank you to everyone who has actively called your bot bot, um, because right now there aren't great ways to label this on the back end schema. Talking about a bit more about people. Um, people come in and out of these various systems and we have to understand how their activities are starting to influence the things that we might end up seeing. So a lot of the times when you're working with data, we are already dealing with data that has been at some point influenced by humans, whether or not it's the thing that we designed and built and instantiated or how our personal feelings, background or context are impacting what we share. Um, and just the processes and policies that we put in place that can dictate what kinds of information can be collected where and how they're shared. The um, reason I bring this up is because within the context of open source, there's less clear accountability over who owns what and dictates what when. If you worked at a company, then the relationships that you have around anything you might be collecting are a lot more clearly defined. You know who your customers are, you know who your partners are, your employees are, and which each of these individual bodies you have a contractual relationship with that explicitly dictates how their information is being collected, how it will be used, and that's outlined publicly in a privacy statement or documentation. Um, when it comes to projects, a lot of this has to be self-defined. Um, something that I love about open source is that every project creates their own 
governance model, their own code of conduct, their own way to make decisions in the project. And all of that is organically defined. Um, but when it comes to something like collecting information around a project and information about people within a project, they, they end up sitting somewhere in the middle of all of this. I'm sorry for, for flipping slides too quickly. Um, and so mostly just to call out that there isn't necessarily a clear accountability structure if you're doing this in the community versus coming from a more established entity. Um, and so as we're thinking about defining that, I like to think about it in terms of all the various people that are involved. Um, and so thinking about how um, knowing again within companies, the relationships are much more explicitly defined and open source being less defined, I like to try to think through all the various people that could come in and influence what you're actually looking at. So there's the people themselves that are generating the information that are submitting pull requests on GitHub. Um, there's the sources like GitHub that are aggregating that information and serve as an information source for whatever follows. Um, the tools themselves that are collecting that information that are set up by people that say which APIs to pull from, which schemas to pull from, how to potentially enrich those indices and put them into tables that might be usable by the analysts. The aggregating entity that is deciding what to retain, how to format it, how to store it, and how to maintain it. Um, and then maybe most the important role, personal bias here is the analyst, how that data is actually communicated back either to the community or to the corporation or whoever else you might be reporting to. Um, and I say it's the most important because it's you're dealing with all of the things that led up to it. Every possible step before, every person that came before you that made a decision in terms of what to share, how to format, how to ingest it, um, and how to treat it before it hits your desk um, has to be acknowledged in terms of how you communicate back in an accurate fashion what we're actually looking at. Um, and to connect this back to the accountability piece, um, I, I want to express all of these details on the who and the when, because within data collected around open source projects, there is an incredible amount of personally identifiable information or PII, which if you are familiar with any sort of regulatory bodies and policies, a lot of these privacy policies are dictated by the amount and level of PII collected. Um, and so again, something amazing about the open source community is that you have the ability to come into a project and to contribute without ever sharing too much about yourself. You have the right to be anonymous in most of these settings. Um, but you also have the ability to share what you want to share and share how much you want to share. Um, you also could be multiple people. Uh, I personally have two GitLab accounts, one that's attached to my personal email, one that's attached to my, per my, my uh, corporate email. Um, and so there are many different ways that I'm volunteering more information beyond just the explicit set of information that I'm knowingly opting into on a platform. Um, and so thinking about, again, the level of PII that you might be collecting, as you potentially start to collect more data over a longer period of time, or maybe more data from more sources, you're going to learn a little bit more about these people, even if they've only sh chosen to share a small subset of information. For an example of how this might play out in real time, um, if you've ever worked with the GitHub APIs, uh, here's an example of how um, push events collect the, the contributor's author, as well as their name, in terms of however they've described it in the event. Um, now, a lot of this is used if you can go into any of the security root of trust talks. This is one of the ways that you can check the hatch to see, does it actually is it attributed back to a known entity, a known person that you could reach out to. Um, additionally, in terms of this platform, sorry, I'm clicking not in the right window. There we go. Uh, I've also chosen to volunteer that I work at Google, that I live in New York, um, and then you can see all of my Git activity. Now, there isn't a lot there. I'm, I'm actually a pretty, pretty low level contributor, um, but I'm, I have a presence. Um, it's more that I've chosen to volunteer this information. And this information now is enough to find me on another social media platform, say LinkedIn, where yes, you can confirm my name, where I work. Um, and I even learned my title. Um, you've also learned where I went to college and where I worked before I worked at Google. Um, so again, more information that I, I didn't share this on GitHub, but I shared enough information on GitHub for you to be able to connect my identity to my other public identities. And now you're starting to amass more information about myself. So if you think about the level of PII that you're collecting, it's only going to grow the more things that you bring in. And not to say that you shouldn't collect PII. There are definitely valid reasons for it. Some projects use it to understand who they should nominate for elections based on contribution levels. Or maybe you want to better understand your population so you can know how to support underrepresented groups if you have a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. Um, on that latter piece, um, I want to talk a little bit more about collection mechanisms. We've been focusing a lot on Git and working with what I'm calling indirect data sources. And I'm saying they're indirect because you're pulling them from the source. You're not actively interacting with the person, the, gen the generator of that information. Um, so you have less influence on what 
people are actually doing on those platforms um, in this in this particular context. Uh, where when we're talking about direct, um, we're going out, we're interviewing people, we're giving them a survey. Um, the way that we write the survey, the way that we approach them, the way that we interact with them has the potential to change what information they share with us. Say, if it's more sensitive, like how they feel or particular feedback that they don't feel comfortable sharing with you, um, then you're not going to get that piece of information if you do it in a public context. So the general suggestion is for these types of data collection that are happening in direct collection mechanisms, keep everything anonymous if you can. Um, and allowing folks to share what they want to by providing opt-ins and opt-outs, especially for more sensitive questions. And this will allow you to only really get what your constituents are willing to share, but also provide them a format that ideally makes them more comfortable sharing things that they might not feel sure, comfortable sharing in an open setting. Um, that goes without saying that you shouldn't be collecting email addresses or any sort of contact information in these formats. This, I'm strongly suggesting against it. If you want to do any sort of follow up contact forms, do that in a separate tool or do that in a separate mechanism just so you don't impede the this anonymity. Um, and then also recognize that in very small communities that you have the potential to know who people are based on what they write, even if you don't ask for any any specific PII. So you as the data collector, manager, distributor um, need to be that sort of gut check to know, OK, is this I attempted to create an anonymous feedback form, but is this feedback actually anonymous? Um, another point of influence can happen at the measurement and the publication of the metric itself. Um, and so here, I, I like to call out um, correlations with natural systems wherever possible. But uh, if you're familiar with the quantum entanglement principle, any measurement of a quantum entangled particle will irreversibly change the original quantum state. So you literally cannot measure it without impacting it. And when we're talking about open source metrics, it's not as rigid of a, rigid of a relationship, but there is the possibility to influence people by showing metrics about them. Um, again, an example here would be in leaderboards. If you're, say, a company and you're trying to incentivize open source contribution and you display, here are all the top contributors by commits for these various projects. Now, if your metric is based on commits and that's how people are being ranked, you're encouraging them to submit more commits versus, say, working in other areas of the project like issues or event management. So being very conscientious with how you choose what to report on because you could be incentivizing behavior whether or not you intend to do that. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, I think it can be a very powerful tool as long as you do it purposefully. So if you have a specific outcome that you're trying to achieve, then you can set metrics against that outcome and choose what are the best parties and people to share these metrics with to ensure that you're tracking them against your goals, but then potentially are you incentivizing the right behavior to achieve those goals. The last section that I want to go into is on policy and regulation. So I chose red because it, it tends to have sort of the, the angry stoplight effect. Um, and here I want to call it that I am an analyst. I am not a lawyer. Um, and so the things that I say are colored by my experience as an analyst working with our legal teams, our policy and regulatory bodies. Um, and that if you have any confusion or point cases that I'm not the expert here and please consult your legal teams. Um, the general rule of thumb here is that there are licenses and policies attached to many things that we could be working with. So you should do your homework and know what impacts you. So what licenses are governing the project, the data set, any particular tooling that you're using that could dictate the kind of data that you're getting and how you can use it and where you can use it. Um, any specific privacy or policy documentation that could be coming from a project, a platform, a company, or any sort of other regulatory body, um, any regional specific regulation, and probably many other facets. There are many angles where these things are, they do have existing terms, policies, and usage policies dictated around them. So it's mostly to know what do these things affect you in terms of what you're trying to do and what data you're using. Um, in addition to this, I put a, a resource that I found from the Linux Foundation that looks at how export um, export controls apply to open source projects in the context of international contribution and contributor basis. Um, I want to bring back the persona slide because here, first we were talking about it from understanding where the people are and where they influence the data that you collect. Here I'm talking about where the people are because a lot of these, these regulations are really dictated around how data around people is being used, but also to understand where each of these decision points can impart additional nuance to what you're dealing with. So say at the user and contributor level and the people that are actually generating this information can choose what they share and don't share versus say in a 
direct customer to company relationship, what you share with the company is typically there's a baseline and set of requirements that you have to share in order to engage or use that product. Where in the context of an open source project, again, you could be an anonymous user, you could be an anonymous contributor, and you're only sharing your GitHub handle and your email. So you choose what to share, you choose a platform that you want to work in or consume from. Um, so that also is an element of choice in terms of opting into those platform specific policies. Um, the platforms themselves have their own data usage policies and regulatory requirements that they are subject to that will dictate how this data is collected and used and how it can be used. Um, and that will influence, say, any tooling or person beyond that point that's aggregating information from those sources. So they're not only are they subject to their own policies and regulations that can be governing that's their tool or project, but also all the things that came before um, from the sources themselves. Um, when data lands on a piece of infrastructure, then typically there could be other policies and regulations uh, in regards to where and how the data is stored and accessed. Um, and then again, thinking about per company policies and per project policies that could be dictated by the project leadership. So all these different various elements where you could encounter additional policy and regulation. Um, but in the context of open source, when we talked initially about that level of ambiguity, you could also encounter very little of these things. Perhaps you're not finding anything beyond the terms and service uses on GitHub. And maybe that's the only thing that you found that's applicable to the data that you're trying to collect. Um, and so here it's sort of up to you as the collector and analyst. Um, but typically the recommendation is if you're starting to collect information that doesn't have any kind of policy attached to it, say you're writing a survey or you're now starting to implement a broad metrics program where you're collecting a lot more information, um, then it might be wise to state your purpose. Maybe if this is going to be a long-term effort, then maybe it's time to create privacy documentation. Um, an example is when the, the chaos community, we initiated a program um, called the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Badging Program, where we help to assess um, events uh, and help them encourage diversity in, in their speakers and how to report on that um, and various metrics that they can use to help encourage the diversity within the representation of both the speaker as well as the event itself. Um, but to do that, we had to collect more detailed information about speaker demographics and realize that the information that we were collecting was more sensitive. Um, and so we thought it was important as a group to state exactly what we were going to do with that information and state exactly how we were going to ensure that it never left our own borders, what we were doing to ensure accountability of ourselves um, and the information that we collected. So it's more again like, are you, are you at a point where you're doing something that's not new, that's unknown, that's collecting a new kind of information that has more sensitivity attached to it, then these are potential all indicators that you should have some element of documentation and some declaration of accountability so that if there is an issue, someone knows who to go to, knows who to ask about. Um, if you do work for a corporate entity, then um, do leverage your legal teams because they're I will tell you as someone who's tried to parse through a lot of privacy documentation and licensing, uh, it can get really dense in the legalese uh, and hard to interpret. So I, I really do value the support of the council teams that I've been able to use. So what do we do now? Um, I put together a series of recommendations, again, geared more toward an analyst and again, my own experience as an analyst in this space. Um, but some general good practices, I don't like the word best practices because I think I'm still learning here and I think practices will continue to improve over time. Um, but particularly when we're talking about reporting any of these metrics that as we could say could mean a whole number of things could require a whole number of different various descriptions and types of contribution and types of data. It's always wise to say, what are you counting? And do it in a way that's explicit enough that somebody else can recreate what you've produced. Um, and not to say that you have to be completely explicit in your language, because that could get pretty wordy if you're saying that there were X number of pull request events that were opened by this population on this date in this repository under this organization in this year. You can see how that could quickly snowball into a pretty dense mouthful that's hard to interpret. Um, so it's okay to use descriptive terms. I would just recommend that you define what those mean. So if you're just saying contribution or engagement, knowing that there can be a huge variety underneath those types of metrics, that you define it so someone else can, again, recreate it and elaborate on it. Um, it's always wise to state your sources. This is how readers can contextualize the information that they're looking at. Where are you pulling this from? What are the methods that were used to collect the information? Um, any assumptions that were made that could lead to bias or boundaries? Typically, anytime you're looking at this kind, of, these variations of data, you have to pick a subset. You have to establish some kind of parameter 
to base your analysis in. Um, but that also means that there could be boundaries around what you're looking at. So acknowledging what those are and how that changes what you're looking at or say, what population or set of contributors does this represent? Um, additionally, noting where and when this data was collected and how this data was collected, knowing that those things could influence uh, what we're looking at. Um, if you're looking at formats or ways to do this, uh, one of the best resources is just looking at academic papers. There's a fairly rigorous methodology to report on the kind of data that is used in any of the analysis that results in the, in the paper itself. Um, but outside of an academic context, it's sort of up to you, the analyst, to define how you want to do this. Um, so I put an example here of a blog that I published earlier in the year where I included an about this data section to state explicitly all the things that I was using, assuming, and counting. Um, I also want to have a quick little exercise here because I think anytime that you're sharing data and numbers, it's very easy to mislead with them. It's misleading, I mean, it's misleading, be misleading with any kind of information, but I think numbers are particularly can be particularly powerful. Um, but without the right context, it's very easy to not really understand or to mislead with those numbers. So I'm going to come back to this bot example. Um, I wrote a couple of more queries to better understand what bots were doing on GitHub in 2020. Um, and I found that there are 30 million pull request uh, events that were initiated by bot-based accounts. Now, if you weren't privy to the prior conversation that we had, you might not remember that this, in fact, was taking place on GitHub. So it might be worth putting that in this self-contained statement. So now we know we're talking about pull request events initiated by bots on GitHub. But I, I'm now kind of still skeptical of this number. I don't know if how to contextualize 38 million. Is that large? It could be. I mean, it's a big number, but in the context of GitHub and all of GitHub, this I don't, I don't really know what that means. So instead of maybe looking at the raw number, maybe a percentage would have a stronger point. So say looking at all of the push requests, pull request events that happened, and then bots as a percentage of that were 44% of those events. So that's actually quite substantial. Um, and now provides a little bit more context for understanding this number and contextualizing this number without having to know too much more information. Um, but I, I would take it one step farther because this is now just a statement out of nowhere, which could be fine. But if you're most likely writing up a broader story and you want to tell, paint more of a picture as, as to what this information could mean in context, then perhaps you need a little bit more historical context. Say, what was this number last year, which was 25%. Um, now, personally, I looked at this and was like, okay, so that's a fairly substantial move what was this number last year and the year before? And I, I found that all the way back to 2017, this same, um, this same query yielded 3% of pull request events on GitHub. So it's gone from 3% to 44% in just a short number of years, um, which is quite substantial growth. And I don't know, I'm interested from research context, which maybe I'll take on at a later date. Um, but here, just the example of pulling just a little bit more information can provide a lot more context and description over what you're trying to convey. Um, and the last point I want to make here is, again, acknowledging this, and you could do it around the statement that we're not actually really positive that this is, in fact, the real number. This is an estimate. It's not a factual number. Um, and I think this is completely fine to acknowledge as long as you acknowledge it. Claiming things that you're uncertain about uh, looks a lot worse than stating that you're uncertain about something and still providing some basis of information. So I would also include somewhere in terms of how I actually pulled this number. So I don't have to completely enumerate all of the shortfalls and potential issues of this methodology, but by stating the methodology up front, um, then other folks can elaborate on who understand how to make this better, how to make this more accurate overall. Um, the last section I want to mention is just on tooling. If you are working with any sort of uh, or working toward any sort of metrics collection or data collection program around your project, then um, you could be assembling tools on your own to try to build something out. Um, the CNCF example, if you're familiar with DevStats, it is based on GitHub Archive as a source pulled into a um, Postgres database that's using visual, the visualization layer of Grafana. Um, whereas in, uh, there are other tools available in the community as well. So here I'm talking about the chaos project. There are two projects under it, Grimora Labs and Augur, that are tools explicitly designed to monitor community metrics and project health. So the last thing I want to close with is just some, some things to remember and to consider as, as an analyst working in and around open source that 
Um, again, if you're doing this in the context of your project, then it's sort of it's on you to really know what you're working with, know your licenses, know your policies, be able to identify what and what does not apply to you. Um, if you're collecting data where it hasn't been collected before, or there's no existing privacy statement around how this information is going to be used, then maybe it's time to write one, um, if, especially if it's something that you plan to, to continue doing and doing on the long run. Um, so designing policies that can continually provide a real-time view of what you're doing um, that really encourage trust and transparency. If we're collecting data around people that we know um, and we want to maintain a relationship with them, then we should be open about what we're doing with that in order to encourage trust and collaboration with them. Um, and again, when you're collecting sensitive information and it's not critical to what you're doing, always provide an opt-out. Um, and questioning whether or not you really need to collect a level of PII just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you need to, depending on what your use case is. And there are, again, definitely valid use cases to collect PII. I recently read a research paper that was modeling social networks around projects. And so clearly you needed to know who the people are to better understand their relationships and connections that they were attempting to measure the influence of on the project. But if you're just looking at a behavioral analysis on GitHub and contribution patterns and productivity, do you need to know individual names? Probably not. Um, so really assessing whether or not you need to know that. And throughout all of this, knowing that when you're working in these public undefined forums, that if you're the one who's now amassing all this information and reporting on it, then it's on you. You're the one who needs to be accountable for it because you're the one who is reporting on it and doing the work. Um, so I don't mean to make it scary, just as a reminder that um, to be responsible with the data that you collect and the way that you use it. 